Welcome to Cheaper Than Therapy, a podcast that journeys into conversations with the intention of demystifying, destigmatizing, and desensitizing what really gets talked about behind the closed doors of the therapy room. I'm Vanessa Bennett. And I'm Danae Selkin. And we're seekers, soul sisters, and holders of sacred space. So join us as we dive into the ways that therapy can be connecting not only to yourself, but also to those around you. Thank you guys for joining again for another episode of Cheaper Than Therapy. We have an incredible guest today. I am going to say right now that I have a newborn in the background, uh, so you may or may not hear some whining or crying on the recording. We'll see. But that's Mm. the beauty of podcasts like this, you know? So Vanessa and I had an opportunity to speak to my beautiful friend, Susie Favor Hamilton, a little while back. And she was so gracious and unbelievable, as she always is, to come back and speak to us now at a time where we are in the midst of something unprecedented on a global level. And you know, before we get into that and talk about that, I just want to introduce Susie a little bit in terms of my relationship with her. And what's so funny about me meeting Susie is that we met in a yoga studio that I taught in for several years in the South Bay. And what I love about yoga studios is that when you meet people in yoga studios, you just meet them um, by their first names. Like, I don't know anybody's last name that I've known for years in the yoga studio. And Susie has a pretty famous name. Like, if you hear her name, you kind of know who that person is. But I didn't know Susie's full name for years um, when I met her. And right from the start meeting her, she is probably one of the most just like grace-filled, thoughtful, present people I have ever met in my entire life. She's one of those people who every single person she comes in contact with, she really goes above and beyond to make sure that person not only that she sees that person, but that that person feels seen by her. Mm. I think she's just such an extraordinary person. Mm. And, you know, getting to know her more, it just feels, um, I don't know, even more like an honor, but it always has, you know, even before I sort of knew the story behind the Susie (laughs) that I knew. So thank you so much for being here with us. It truly, truly means the world to us. Well, thank you, Danae. And, you know, it's interesting because... I had been searching all the yoga studios in the South Bay Mm. and I stepped into Soho Yoga and immediately I found my people. Mm. And when I say I found my people, that means I found incredible people that were so open, that weren't afraid to show their real side to me. And I don't know if it was because I'm I'm very open and I just Mm. say things right off the bat. But I was hearing these incredible stories from the yoga teachers, and I was blown away. I was, wow, that teacher went through so much, Mm -hmm. but found yoga, and it's like it saved their life. And for me, when I found the yoga studio, instantly I knew that this was the best therapy Mm -hmm. for me, which is really odd if people say yoga is a therapy. Of course yoga is a therapy. It Mm -hmm. brings out these deep emotions. But Danae, especially when I first took your class, I was blown away. Not only because you teach my favorite moves um, in the class, literally you do. I always think of that, my favorite teacher, my favorite moves. But, but what, what you brought um, to me and you still do is a passion for life, a passion for caring for people. And in the class, you would make everybody feel so relaxed and at peace with themselves. And that was the part of the therapy that was changing me. And I had no idea that you had this other life to you. You know, we see our yoga teachers as just teaching yoga. (laughs) And yet we all have something behind our major passion. Mm. But I'm so glad that I got to know you in your passion because it just, you know, when you're in your passion, you light up. Mm -hmm. and you're alive and that's what a gift okay well I'm just gonna I love to cry (laughs) (laughs) oh thank you Susie thank you so much for that well I mean I'm I'm just meeting obviously I mean we met a little bit via audio before but I'm I'm super glad to be here with you I mean obviously I love Danae she's like my soul sister so I can I'm sitting here going "Mm -hmm, mm -hmm," with everything you're saying (laughs) I'm like let's just shower today with compliments all day (laughs) I'm okay with that (laughs) this is how I set this up my grand plan is working out wow 
Fluffy, here you go. Yeah. Well, you know, Susie, I, I want us to give um, our listeners an opportunity to hear a little bit about your story. I feel like what has been so powerful for me um, as a therapist is how much I am inspired by you constantly. And mm-hmm. we'll give your Instagram handle um, for anybody who doesn't follow Susie on Instagram. You've got to follow her because there's just so much authenticity, so much realness. And you speak to the experiences that we all have so beautifully. And I think that your book, Fast Girl, does that. It's so amazing. Before I get into all of the things that I was so moved by in your story, I'd love for you to just give a little bit of background. I think, you know, everybody pretty much knows you as a runner, but um, whatever you want to share about, you know, just how mental health became something that you became really passionate about. Um, sure. Yeah. I'll, I'll make it really quick because my story has so many layers. It's such a <laughs> long story to tell. So if I'm going a little fast, you'll understand, but I'll try to make it where you can really grasp the hold of this. But as a child, um, I was the perfect child. Basically, um, I wanted to bring happiness to my family. My brother was diagnosed with bipolar. And because of his bipolar, his behaviors were so erotic. They were so um, erratic. Mm -hmm. And I almost said erotic. (laughs) Um, Erratic. (laughs) And the thing with... um, the the pressure I felt was to make up for his behavior. Mm -hmm. And what I did was run and win. And I became the center of attention for the family. Mm -hmm. This was a lot to carry as a child. Um, Fast forward, I won many titles. I became an Olympian three times. And the pressure was mounting on me. And nobody knew the issues that were going on in my brain. But I silently was suffering. I had retired at age 37 from my career. My daughter was born and something changed in me really quickly after childbirth. And I went to the doctor, they told me I had postpartum, but I knew it wasn't postpartum. I've always had this illusion that postpartum was something where you didn't wanna be by the baby. You didn't Mm. wanna hold the baby. Is that correct, you guys, or is it much deeper? I think that that's one of the symptoms, but I think even depression that doesn't have anything to do with childbirth, I think, shows up for so many people in so many ways. And I think that, you know, doctors and psychiatrists try to label things, but it can be different for everybody. I I mean, I imagine that the hormonal shift, I'm sure, was part of what kicked it off, right? So I guess in that way, we could call it postpartum, but maybe it didn't present for you like it does for a lot of people. And so what, what it was, you know, there, I went into the doctor and Mm -hmm. 10 minute visit, Mm -hmm. the doctor told me you have depression. So she gave me an antidepressant. It was um, Zoloft, which is a great drug for so many people, but something happened uh, to me when I started taking the drug. I, I definitely felt great. I felt alive, but it was really, really bizarre how alive I felt. Mm -hmm. And my husband, he was he was really happy. He's like, wow, have you changed so quickly? And it was within three weeks that I started to notice the change. Our marriage was not going well at that time because of my depression. And um, having a new child, there's all these new changes in your life to get used to. And there's no guide on, Mm -hmm. on what you do with the child. Every child is different. And so my husband and I made a quick decision to do something for our 20th wedding anniversary, hopefully to re-spark our marriage, get closer. And so we took a trip to Vegas. Uh, We jumped out of an airplane, something I couldn't have ever done in my life. But at this time, I didn't realize that the drug they had given me was making me delusional, alive. I was starting to say and do things that I could never have done in my life. And so jumping out of the airplane was one of them. And then to rekindle our marriage, we're, you know, we're thinking, let's do some fantasy that we've always wanted to do or something we've talked about, something that we probably wouldn't have done. But because of this drug, again, I was on board for anything. Mm-hmm. And so we had actually planned a threesome in Vegas. Um, we had done this weeks before and through a high-end agency. We had the threesome. I was on fire afterwards. I was alive. And Mm -hmm. I think I had always had this desire to be with a woman. And I didn't know, you know, maybe inside I thought, well, maybe I'm bisexual. Maybe I'm not. But through that experience, it made me realize 
okay, this is truly who I am and I'm not going to hide it anymore. But that experience changed me in that I wanted to explore my sexual background mm -hmm. because I was the perfect child. I trained my whole life. I was one dimensional and now I'm living life. Um, fast forward because there's so much in between all of this. Um, I had a sexual exploration and my husband and I had agreed to have an open marriage. Mm -hmm. And so this meant a freedom, a sexual freedom. And I took this to the highest limit you could take it in that I wanted to become an escort in Vegas um, because we had hired that ex es escort. And because I had this exploration, I knew I want to take on this. I want to just try it once. Once became a full year and I became an escort in Vegas. I personally see nothing wrong with sex work. Um, but at the time when I was doing this, I feel like the drug made it easy to jump into this world. Um, I had only one sexual partner my entire life and that was my husband. So for me to go from there to being a full-time escort was, was quite a change. But it, it feels like the drug was almost the fuse, right? Like, like all of this stuff was internal and inside of you. And to your point, it was almost like really repressed your whole life because you were trying to keep up this persona for so long. And then this drug, and I would say it's manic, right? It gave you this yes. manic behavior, lit that fuse and, and almost exploded it for you. Absolutely. That's such a great way of explaining it. Yeah. But yeah, I was on fire. I mm. think my brain was on fire. Sounds like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it sounds like, you know, it's funny. I say that and, and I don't, I'm not saying that with any layer of like guilt or shame. It's like, to your point, you were exploring this side of yourself, right? And perhaps this drug made you do things in a way that maybe you wouldn't have otherwise, but there, it's almost like a double-edged sword because part of it was like, yes, this is amazing you're out there, you're exploring, you're finally able to tap into parts of yourself that you probably would have loved to your whole life. And yet there's this balance of like, how, um, you know, is it, is it dangerous? Are you, know, are you doing things safely? Was it a little bit too much because it felt erratic, right? So I don't know, I'm aware of that, that double-edged sword. And, and no, you're, you're exactly right. Because my behavior, again, I don't see anything wrong with what I did, but my behavior became so risky and mm -hmm. dangerous. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize that I would soon be diagnosed with bipolar. And mm -hmm. what ended up happening with my escorting is a client who wanted to marry me. And obviously I was not interested in marrying anybody. I wanted to stay with my husband. I wanted to work on a relationship Yet at the same time, I was ruining our relationship mm -hmm. by doing what I was doing. So this client outed me, he told a tabloid, and basically the tabloid guy said, I'm going to ruin your life, mm -hmm. and gave me two weeks to prepare by telling family that I was an escort in Vegas. I mean, imagine telling your parents, and I grew up in a religious family, and imagine making the phone call and saying, mom, dad, um, I was an escort in Vegas. And I remember my father saying, what, what's that? He didn't quite understand the term. And so I said, dad, I'm a prostitute um, in Vegas. And then I think that's when it sunk into him, very calm. And I think he was in shock, obviously. Mm -hmm. How could this daughter who's so perfect and does mm -hmm. no wrong mm -hmm. could take such a turn? Mm -hmm. um, and that part right there, that is... That hits me hard, right? If I imagine it's not just, I think for most people to call and have that conversation would be hard, but for the perfect child to call yeah. and have that conversation, mm -hmm. it, it brings it, was, it to a whole other level. Yeah. And the, the pain I had just, you know, at that moment given my parents was, mm -hmm. it was, uh, you know, if, if I could change anything, it would be the pain that I caused them. Um, I wish I could take that away. But at the same time, this gave me an out mm -hmm. from being that perfect child, mm -hmm. something I had wanted. I didn't want to be that person any, anymore. I didn't want to be the one who could do no wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm human. Yes. And I felt like I had brought my family so much happiness through my running. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was their happiness. So when I was outed, all of a sudden, their happiness is gone. And I felt incredibly responsible for that. Through therapy, I realized, you know, I, I wasn't responsible for anybody's happiness in my family. 
Well, you know, I feel like that's such an interesting thing from a family systems perspective, because mm -hmm. we always think about the thing that is the disruption of the pattern in the family system, whatever the black sheep child or the problem child, right, is normally the person that is sort of calling us to awaken mm -hmm. to the dysfunction or calling us to mm -hmm. look at the thing that is not working, right? And in this case, you know, I as I was reading your story, Susie, I was so, to Vanessa's point, I was a little in an inner battle because in so many ways I felt liberated by some of the things you were allowing yourself to experience and express and finally like you know take some of these shackles that i think so many of us feel as women in numerous ways you know mm -hmm. um putting down some of that shame and yet you sort of describe it like a high that um i was getting this increased tolerance for the high right so i keep i kept needing to up the ante we speak to that a little bit of like how things were progressing yeah, I didn't, I honestly didn't realize that I was manic at that time. Mm. I thought this was me. I thought, right. okay, finally, this is the person who I've always wanted to be. You know, I still struggle with the part, uh, because I've evolved so much from this story. It, sure. it happened seven years ago. Um, and I, I've evolved so much in that I wonder, what was the real me mm. Um and what wasn't. And so I feel like I'm getting a better understanding of myself now because I have evolved as a person. I've accepted the fact that, um, you know, I did, I did some crazy things that were out of line and I hurt people and that I'm so sorry that I hurt my family. But I also realized that, you know what, I am a highly sexual person. And is that something to be ashamed of? Absolutely not. I'm, I'm liberated by it. And I'm so open and talking about it and helping other women uh, get rid of the shame if they're highly sexual people too, or enjoy sex, whatever it is, mm -hmm. that they shouldn't be shamed for that. And I was shamed so terribly because of my story from people I didn't know, from you know family, friends. I lost friends because of this, but the blessing was they really weren't true friends because they would be there for you. Well, and I think for our listeners too, you know, I want to just go back really quick for Danae, what you said about family systems. So for those of you who don't know, the, the super top line of family systems, right, is that as therapists, we look at the family as an organism. So when we're treating the family, we're treating the whole family as an organism, right? And we all know that organisms from biology class like homeostasis, right? And so whenever anybody in that group pulls outside of the norm, right? So whatever your behavior is, it pulls that organism out of homeostasis. And typically the rest of the family will do something or act in a way to suck that person back into their role so that things can go back to quote unquote normal, even if that normal is actually not really normal, right? So for you, Susie, it's like, this is what your role was, right? You were the good child. You were the perfect one. You were the light for your family to try to keep, you know, all the pain that your brother, obviously not on purpose, was, was causing. And so all of a sudden, you broke out of that. You broke out of that role. And I, I also hear you saying too, it's like, how much is good and how much is bad from that? Like, I, I can just picture this young woman, you know, like you said, you had one partner your whole life. I, knowing myself as a woman, right? Like, I can only imagine that feeling of freedom that comes from like, holy shit, I'm actually really sexual and this is amazing and I enjoy this and there's the shame and there's this stigma and, 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 right? And so I think it's beautiful that you're actually putting words to that, first of all, um, because so many of our listeners and so many women out there don't have the words. And I think, you know, like Danae said, with your Instagram and all the things you do now, I mean, you are liberating a lot of women. I, I don't know if you realize that, but you are Thank giving you. voice to so many women out there. And I, I think that's beautiful. 100%. You know yes. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm like, yes. yes. <laughs> you, you said this in such an incredible way that nobody's ever said this. Mm -hmm. I, a psychologist, psychiatrist. But what you said, it just, it just hit me now that, yes, my family, I pulled away, but they were pulling me back in. Right. And I didn't want back in. And, and right. that's... That is truly amazing. And I guess this is more common than I thought. Right. And that's where this, like, for you, it was the drug that lit the fuse, right? The manic behavior. But that's where we usually see whoever that quote unquote, either the black sheep or the good child that turns into the quote unquote black sheep, right? We see an explosive behavior happen in a way where it's like, no, I'm going to drop this bomb because you're not going to pull me back into this system. 
And in a lot of times with family therapy, we see that child do something really extreme unconsciously. Like there's no way I'm going back. Yeah. And I think, you know, Vanessa and I come from a depth psychology background. And what is interesting about the way that we learn to hold psychology is a little bit that, you know, mental illness as we hold it in this country, a lot of times there are other ways to look at it other Mm -hmm. than what we've held to be true. Like in so many cultures, the person who is considered mentally ill is either the shaman or the, you know, um, the witch doctor or the person who is like the the wise elder. Yes. And they see things that the rest of us don't have access to. The rest Mm -hmm. of us aren't able to see, you know, you talk about in, in the book, Susie, that more than mental illness going on with your brother and the family, the more serious issue that plagued us was silence, right? Mm -hmm. Something was going on that we were all experiencing, but nobody could talk about it, right? And I sort of almost see your brother in that system as being like, let's talk about this. Like, Mm -hmm. let's bring it to the surface. Nothing bad happens when we talk about it, but so often it's the resistance to speaking to the pink elephant in the room that nobody's talking about that keeps us in that space of suffering, I think. Totally, completely agree. And so looking back at my brother, you know, I don't, I know he didn't get the right help that he needed Mm -hmm. or or we weren't, you know, families just weren't talking. And with my, you know, with my brother, his bipolar, I didn't mention this in my brief description, his bipolar got to a point where he ended up taking his life and he died by suicide at age 37. Mm -hmm. Kind of um, ironic. That's when my issues started in my life. But, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I know listeners out there are, have dealt with the suicide, either family or a friend. And I always try to tell people that it's nobody's fault. And there's so much guilt and blame. And, and my family went through all of that and still does. And if you can realize that the brain was so unhealthy, mm-hmm. and, and this is to the viewers, it, my brother was gone. He, that wasn't my brother who died by suicide. Um, that was an unhealthy brain that took its life. Um, healthy brains don't take their life. And his brain was so diseased, just like having cancer. Mm-hmm. And that's why another thing that I really strongly feel about is some people say, they'll say, I am bipolar mm-hmm. or um, I have bipolar. And I personally don't define myself as bipolar. Mm-hmm. I say I have bipolar meaning I, it's, it's just like cancer. It's like mm-hmm. any, I have bipolar. I'm not bipolar. I'm not cancer. Mm-hmm. And I think it's, it's just something I really feel strongly about. And the mental health community is really trying to change that and help people understand this isn't something we should be ashamed of. This is a, an illness of the brain, biggest organ we have, mm-hmm. yet we stigmatize it. And it, it needs to, it needs to change. Susie, I want to ask you if you will just sort of expand on this idea of family members, of someone struggling with a mental illness, because, you know, I think so many of us can relate to this feeling of helplessness, feeling of I have lost someone that I love and sort of the more that I try to grasp control of what I am experiencing happening with them, the more they resist, the more they pull away from me. Um, What do you feel like family members can do to support someone they love who is struggling? It is, it's incredibly hard as you guys know, because many times like myself, you don't see that there is a problem. I saw the problem as being everybody else. Let me be, I'm free. I'm living the life I've always wanted. Um, I didn't know this was the life I wanted, but it's making me alive. And I had to be outed to hit rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Even rock bottom didn't happen when I was outed. Rock bottom happened a year later just through therapy and being shamed, uh, that became rock bottom. Being suicidal myself became rock bottom. But when it comes to a loved one, we need to support Mm -hmm. and not focus on the behaviors. And too often, we focus on the behaviors. Many times with mental illness, you'll have a loved one who ends up in jail. And then, then you're, you know, many people are embarrassed and don't want to support that. That's when the loved one needs the support the most. 
and when the, when they hit rock bottom, but so often they have to get there themselves. And right. that's hard telling people, telling them, you know what, you've done everything you've done. You've, you've tried to get them to therapy. You've tried to get them to take their medication. It's, it's when there's nothing more you can do. You throw your hands up in the air and you're like, I, I just can't do anymore. I'm done. Hmm. Well, I think that's a really good point, right? So for me listening, you know, as I'm definitely a, a codependent through and through, um, and I've done my work around it and Al-Anon and all the things. And so I think also for family members out there that are listening who do have somebody with mental health issues, right? I'm not saying that somebody with mental health issues is exactly the same, obviously, as like an addict, but as the codependent, I will say trying and trying and trying to fix and save and fix and save, right, is also not healthy. So to your point, Susie, sometimes you do have to, not sometimes, most, most of the time, you do have to walk away and let that person have their experience and hit whatever their bottom is because you as the family member do not have control over somebody else's life and the decisions that they're making, right, if they're an adult. And so that's really hard for a lot of people to understand if it's their brother or their partner or their son or whatever, right? To say, this person's making these decisions and it could end up with them, you know, dead or in jail or whatever, but there's nothing I can do. And that person has to also want your help, right? You can't, you can't crowbar your help in there. And so I think that's also a really important thing to say. It's like, what do you do as a family member when that person doesn't want your help? You know, to your point. I felt great. I was out there. I was doing my thing. What can a family member do? You know, you were on your path. They couldn't have done anything. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You had to get there on your own. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. It feels like the distinction between um, allowing that person to take responsibility, Mm -hmm. to sort of take hold of their life versus shame. You know, right. what I loved so much in your book and read Susie's book. It's amazing yeah. people. But um, I also feel like your book is such a love story um, about you and your husband, Mark. And I shout out to Mark. I, I loved mm-hmm. at the end when you talked, you talked about how he says that shame is a waste of time and energy, right? So it's really not about like shaming this person, but also I think allowing this person to take responsibility for their life, right? right. Like this is your life and what, how do you want to live it, right? right. I can love you, right? Yeah. I can support you as, as a loving partner or family member, but I'm not going to rescue you from or I'm not going to interject myself into, right? It's like you have to go down your own path. And he did that, you know, he, he was the one who said to me, it was a pivotal moment. He said to me, um, either you decide to forgive yourself, Mm. or if you're not going to forgive yourself, you're going to be stuck here Mm. and we're going to struggle because you're going to continue to have good days and bad days. And that, that kind of, there's certain things that click and that just clicked. And I realized he's right. You know, people are trying to do this to me. Society is the mm. one who keeps pulling me down and I try to get back up, but then the next day I'll get some email and they'll shame me and pull me back down. And so what he was saying is you have to let these people go. Mm. These people are the ones that have the problems. They're the ones who are really struggling. You shouldn't be listening to them. Shame will kill you. Mm. And I realized that because the shame of society, I had two suicide attempts and that was mainly because of what society was telling me. I mean, one of the comments was, you should take your life just like your brother did. Mm. Uh, People telling me I should die. Mm. Um, And you keep constantly hearing this in in your worst moment, at your lowest moment. And and that's that's something I really, truly want to help people with, is get rid of all that negative. Get away somehow. Find a safe place around safe, wonderful people. And that's why I I was in the beginning stressing how my yoga studio, they embraced me. They Mm. loved me. They, many of the people read my book. They didn't care. They're like, we all have shit. Big deal. (laughs) We we love you. And and that's what I mean. I, when I say I found my people, I found the people who accepted me and what a beautiful thing. And, And everybody can find that. But you can't mm-hmm. sit at home and wait for it to happen and feel sorry for yourself. You have to make an effort to get out there as uncomfortable as it might be. You're in control. So do it. Go find your people who accept you. Yeah. And many times you have to break away from family. Yeah. Family can be a huge source 
of, for me, a huge source of my issues um, that I had to make some boundaries mm -hmm. and the boundaries helped to make me healthy. Right. And I think that's like speaking to like therapy and to you, what I've, you know, we've talked about before this idea of being properly diagnosed, being put on the right medication, right? You went through all of that in order to be in this place where you can be boundaried and you can get out there and find your people, you know, like if people are listening and they're in the stage that you were in before, understand it's not a light switch. You know, there is work that has to be done in order to get to the place that you're in right now. Yeah. And, the, and like you said the, about the medication, when I started my recovery, which was basically the second day after my story came out, I found that I needed doctors. I needed the right care. I needed the right people. I needed to isolate myself from the negativity mm -hmm. around me. And that really helped. And I, I needed to be away from my husband and my daughter because I wasn't in a healthy place to be a part of that um, nucleus that was, mm -hmm. you know, my daughter was the focus and I needed to get better so I could come back and be a part of this beautiful family mm -hmm. that was there waiting for me. Mm -hmm. I just, I just didn't know that um, I could get there. But through a year of therapy and working my ass off, I was able to join Mark and Kylie. And we all embraced. And Kylie was, you know, she kept saying, Mommy, I'm so glad you are healthy and you're back. And, you know, heartbreaking as it was, I realized what a gift to have your child tell you mm -hmm. how much she wants you and mm -hmm. how she loves you so much. And, and that... It, it, it was such a gift to have that. People could say, oh, I, you know, I really screwed up and I can't forgive myself. I can't believe I did this to my husband and daughter. You know, these things happen and we do them for a reason, but we can't hold it against ourselves. We can dive back in on a clean slate and have a fabulous, wonderful life if that's truly what we want for ourselves. And I think ultimately everybody does. Right. Absolutely. And I think ultimately that is the lesson that you have taught your child. And I think that all of us are striving to teach our children as parents, right? As we make space for our own humanity, we teach them how to do the same, right? Um, that yes, we are all going to fall. We are all going to have moments where we feel like we are struggling. But as I allow myself to be human through those struggles, I'm showing you that your humanity is allowed as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, what an unbelievable thing and to I teach your daughter. It is. And I think people need to know kids are amazingly strong. I mean, mm. they're, they're unbelievable. So resilient. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And my daughter, you know, we explained it to her. Um, a, a, a very sex positive psychologist told us, um, you're going to have to start talking to her about what's going on. And so what she told us is for me to tell her that I had a lot of boyfriends. She was seven years old. And I told her, people are taking my pictures and they're obviously, I'm sorry, they're taking your picture too. But one of the reasons is because I had a lot of boyfriends. And when I told her this, we were walking back from school and she said, well, what are their names? And so I just listed off names and <laughs> as simple as that was the question. And then after I listed off names, she's like, okay, mom, um, can you set up a play date? I said, sure. So it was so like, just to dive in was pretty easy to that get was it. there. <laughs> she just wanted to yeah. know their names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are their names? Okay. Yeah. yeah. And now today, today it's, if it comes up, I would say it probably comes up once a week, some comment. Right. Um, even a teacher at school was talking about prostitution. And she just, she's like, I wanted to raise my hand, but I knew I couldn't. <laughs> so <laughs> she she understands, and we like to say the more politically correct term as a sex worker, sex worker. Mm -hmm. and um, which I have no problem. I support that a hundred percent. I do not support um, pimps, uh, sex trafficking. There are some major issues that mm -hmm. need to be addressed, and I think if we legalize it, we can help so many people. Mm -hmm. Just my two cents. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, for anybody out there who's listening going, you know, I would, I would um, challenge you if there's any kind of resistance or judgment coming up for you when you're, you're hearing us have this conversation to look inward, right? Mm -hmm. And to look at right. what that judgment is and where it's coming from. 
um, you don't have to agree. You're, you're totally entitled to have your own opinion about this conversation. Um, and that's fine. But I would say look inward if there's judgment, right? Because typically the judgment comes from our, ourselves. It, it has something to do with us not being okay with something about ourselves or you know, some, some corner, some, some shadow part of, of ourself. I'm so glad you brought that up because yeah. I've been judged to, I mean, enormous amount. And I realized that mm. judgment, <clears throat> judgment should not exist. Yeah. And, and again, it's the people that are judging that are, you guys have the issues that you need to address mm -hmm. whether, and in my case, the judgment is coming against sex mm -hmm. and that I'm the whore, I'm the slut, mm -hmm. all these things. And I had a guy write in <clears throat> to me, um, calling me a slut and a whore and what an awful person I was. And I never, I never respond to trolls, but for some reason this just, you know, I felt like I need to respond. And mm -hmm. I responded to him basically just telling him, I'm so sorry you feel this way about me, blah, blah, blah. He texted me back or he, it was on Instagram. He, he re DM'd me back and he said, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. And I had, um, I had some sexual trauma happen to me as a young child. Right. And I'm, I'm very sorry that I lashed out at you. And many times this judgment is because of some sexual past that they've had. And I, I feel awful for these people, but. Or a very repressed sexual past, right? Yes, it, it's exactly. One of the other. Mm -hmm. And the, the reason I feel bad is because they aren't out there getting the help they need and right. they aren't getting the hug and the love. And if every person that judges me, if I could just have two minutes to give you a big hug and tell you it's okay, I would love to do that. Be judgment bullies, they're the ones that are hurting so tremendously. And yet we just want to flip them off or whatever. That's not what they need or scold them back. You know, yeah. that's why I don't respond. But I responded to this guy because I knew he was hurting. You sensed, you sensed it. Oh, he was so angry and lashing out and, you know, doesn't even know me. Like, wow, this person needs some serious help. You know, that's like, a, of love. that's an interesting, like, I don't want to go on a tangent, but I, when but, I was working with a bunch of teenagers, um, when I was in my training, a lot of times, obviously bullying was huge, right? We we're talking about high schoolers. And so much of the time we would talk about the, how bad we felt for the bully. So much of what I talked to them about was like, God, I, I would actually say it's like empathy teaching, right? Especially for a kid that age. I'd be like, don't you think it's so heartbreaking that that person is hurting so much that the only way that they can feel good is to make you feel bad? And it would be this thing where we would get down to this level and they'd be like, oh my God, yeah, like I do feel so bad for that person. They must be in so much pain. And so when you're able to flip it that way, which you just did so beautifully and say like, this person was lashing out and it was so obvious that they were in pain. So rather than you shutting down or the other response, you then lashing back out, right? You're actually able to see them in their humanness and reach out and say, hey, I'm really sorry that you're hurting. What a different way to have a conversation. Yes, and then you aren't carrying that anger right. at all because right. there's no point in, in carrying anger when you know that person needs to be loved, needs to reconcile whatever issues have gone wrong. Right. Yeah. And I feel like that's so much of the work that we do in therapy, right? Is mm -hmm. going back and unpacking the story, right? Or, you know, and trying to understand like, where did this originate? Whatever it is, the belief that I have that I sort of hold to be true. Well, where did I learn that? Like who, mm -hmm. you know, we don't come into this body, this form with certain belief systems or that I need to be perfect in right order to be worthy of love. Like what, yes, all of these things are things that someone has taught us, but if we don't take the time to challenge it and say, well, is this true for me? Or is this someone else's voice that's sort of repeating in my head every time I have this reaction, right? And so what I love so much about the work that you do, Susie, is you sort of call on all of us and give us permission by you living so honestly and authentically that we get to go back and challenge these ideas about perfectionism and body image and sexual identity and sort of say, mm, what's actually true for me though? Mm -hmm. You know, what is true beyond what I've been taught to believe? Hmm. Right. And you know what, I'm, I'm always fascin fascinated, like with you two, like what led you into this field? Because mm. it's, isn't that a great question? Do people ask you that a lot? Because you're, what you're doing is changing lives. Mm. You're doing something so dramatic 
to a person. I mean, literally, you can change the views, you can change the trauma that's in them. So like, what drew you guys in? I mean, I think for both of us, and I'm, you know, I'm speaking yeah. for you, V, but I think it was our experience of transformation through therapeutic work, you know, right. that our own work, doing inner work and understanding ourselves and having and our yoga. healing for and both yoga, of us. for mm-hmm. sure. And wanting to pay forward, which I think is what leads so many people to want to teach yoga is this has been mm-hmm. so powerful in my own life that I want to pay forward what I've been given. And I realized how much I loved that space of having these conversations um, about the things that nobody talks about. Like, I'm like, let's talk about it. Let's all talk about it. And that's, I think, why I, you know, resonate so deeply and always have with you, Susie, is because I feel like there are certain people amongst us who are the ones who are saying, no, 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 no. Like, forget that. We're going to talk about the things that we're not allowed to talk about. Let's talk about it. And how liberating and healing it is for all of us. You know, Mm -hmm. I think as we see people speak to the things that aren't allowed to be talked about. It's like, oh, we can talk about that. I didn't know. Nobody told me, you know? Yeah. Right. And, and that's like, then, you're our mascot, Susie, because that's the whole reason why we even started doing this podcast, right? Yes. You'll yeah. have to tell me your reason too, but I want to ask Danae. Um, Danae, I know you hold these retreats and mm-hmm. I want you so badly to tell me when your next retreat is and your listeners too, because mm-hmm. the retreat that you, I don't know if it was recent, but some of my fellow yogis went and they said it was life changing. Mm. They were in tears and they could just feel the things lifting out of their body and their mind, just releasing so much that they had carried in there. And there's always something, we can always continue the work on ourselves. So I think this would be something so helpful to me to be a part of uh, Mm. one of your retreats. So you should keep keep me posted and keep your viewers posted because this, this, you know, what I've heard from what you did was a gift. So I want to experience that gift. Thank you so much. (laughs) It was such a gift for me, you know, and I think it's in one of those ways of something that I have wanted to do. And, you know, you know how you can sort of watch people doing something from afar and think to yourself, like, I'd love to do that, but like, who am I to do that? And then at some point this question becomes, but you know, if this is something I feel called to do, maybe there's a reason, right? And Mm -hmm. so as I sort of step into the space of doing things I long to do, I think it empowers other people to do the same, you know? And I think that that's like the lesson that is coming to me more and more that um, I'm such an introvert. I'm such, I'm not a shy person, but I'm not that person that likes to put myself out there. (laughs) Um, But I see that like a lot of times it becomes more about like, but how can I be of use to other people if I'm willing to put myself out of my comfort zone a little bit? Mm-hmm. Well, I think you both should do a retreat together. Well, we'll talk to them. Awesome. I will be there. I will be there. <laughs> well, we wanted to do it this spring, but I don't think any of us will live in our house for a retreat. Maybe we'll do yeah. a virtual retreat. <laughs> the universe had other plans. Because <laughs> I'll bring all my people. Mm, and, yeah. and they're your people too. So. Wow. But tell me, I want to know how you got into the psychology. I mean, I think today kind of nailed it. I think for both of us, it was through our own transformational work, you know, and I think, I think what's been interesting for me is that I'm, I'm a little bit of an anomaly in the therapy world um, as like a very outgoing extroverted personality type. We're very rare, actually. Most therapists are more introverted and kind of introspective. Um, but I think for me, it was about similar to what you said. It's this idea of paying it forward, right? It was so huge for me and it was life-changing for me that I wanted to go out there and, and uh, hit people over the head and drag them into the experience. I have since learned that that's not how therapy works, but, <laughs> but I think one of the most beautiful things I've learned about the therapeutic process is actually how little I'm doing. Mm. And I say that as somebody, like I said, who is extroverted and does want to be the teacher and be out there and speaking, but it actually isn't really about me. I'm, I'm more of a conduit than anything. And I might help shine the flashlight on things, but I'm not holding the flashlight. And so I think that's really important for a lot of um, people to understand that haven't maybe done therapy. Um, you know, we're not your teacher. We're just there to hold the container and help you feel safe to do your own exploration. And we might maybe shine a light on a dark spot, but it's not my work, you know? And that's, yeah. you know, that's something I found through the, the really good therapists and psychologists I had. They weren't going to tell me mm-hmm. what to do. Mm-hmm. I, I had a couple that told me what to do. They got fired instantly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, 
the ones that were there to support and help me figure things out and not tell me, you can't do this, you can't do that, that's awful, that's bad. Obviously, they tell you, you know, if you're going to hurt yourself or hurt others. Right. Um, but they're, they, I never had somebody tell me you were a bad person, what you did was bad. I actually had this uh, woman in Wisconsin who was, she grew up with hippie parents. Mm. And she was so supportive of me and the lifestyle that I wanted with my husband. Mm. She said, you guys are incredibly sex positive and sex positive means consent and to stay healthy and agree on the nucleus. You guys need to agree on what's going to be right for your life. Mm. She really helped us in a dramatic and that's it, way. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. That, that's her role to play. She's not there to judge. Mm -mm. Because, you know, what you said at the beginning of our conversation, Susie, is that, you know, I've sort of come into a deeper level of understanding myself and growth yeah. within myself. And hopefully at its best, that's what therapeutic work is about, right? So I am here as a therapist to be on this journey of self-understanding with you. I don't know what's best for you. I can be curious about you. I can ask questions to hopefully hope both of us learn more about who you are. But what is true for me and what I hold to be true is not necessarily your truth at Shit, all. I don't even know what my own truth is half the time, right? <laughs> like, let's, let's talk about that. Like, as a therapist, I don't have my shit all figured out. You know what I mean? So who am Absolutely. I to tell you what your truth is? <laughs> and that's, a gr that's such a beautiful thing. Yeah. Uh, again, because we're not perfect. Right. Who we're meeting each other be, there. Yeah. yeah. Who wants to be perfect? Yeah. yeah. That's perfect boring. Is Whatever. Played. So boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As somebody who yeah. struggles with perfectionism, it is it is a dangerous drug, I will say. Mm. But we all we all need compassion. We all need mm -hmm. love. We all need to be good to each other. Get rid of the judgment in your life. Um, and find, find a way to help society in some, yeah. some good way, whether it's waving and saying hi to somebody who looks down that day. Yeah. Just mm. being good to people. Why can't we all just do this? Mm. We can. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's our I love flag you to so wave. much, Susie. <laughs> <laughs> really, truly. Vanessa and I have some lightning round questions that um, we want to ask our guest if it feels okay to do a couple of questions. Um, so our first one is, what brings you into a flow state? When we think of flow state, we think of a state of being where I am just like in a force that is bigger than me. I could do this forever if I were allowed to. I just love being there and would do it all the time if I could. Yeah, well, like today I walked nine miles. That is mm. a flow state for me. Mm. I feel like I can just continue the whole day. I could walk all day long. And, you know, I have to say, people always ask me, why are you so carefree? I, I've always been carefree, but I don't hold things in. Mm. I don't, I don't mm. hold resentment. Um, mm. And I think that helps me stay in such a good state of evenness. And also the drugs that I take, the Lamictal for my bipolar, that really helps to turn my brain off. And I know it frustrates people because they're like, don't you remember what I told you? Don't you remember that issue? And I'm like, no, I don't carry it with me. I, I forgot. <laughs> Tell me about it. So they have to remind me. So it's very easy for me to get into that state. And I wish I had a way to help people get in. But I think the way is to find a passion what is something super easy to do that you love mm -hmm. and, and embrace that and then just go after it. And I'm, I'm telling you, walking is really quite easy for everybody to do mm -hmm. unless we have something that's holding us back and we're unable to walk. But something as simple as exercise mm -hmm. can clear the mind. Why do we tell people with depression to go out and exercise? Right. Well, it's, body. first of all, it's very, very hard when somebody's in a deep, dark depression. And I always, you know, I've had a few people ask me, um, they said, yeah, my so-and-so is very depressed and she only got out of bed to, to brush her teeth. And I'm like, wow, yeah. first of all, that's a big step, yeah. getting out of bed mm. to brush your teeth. Let's applaud these little steps instead of saying, why can't you get out and get dressed and go shopping? You know, let's look at it slowly mm -hmm. and with compassion and applaud the little steps instead of yeah. jumping. 
Yeah. Um, you know, just that sort of reminded me as you were saying about, you know, how we show up for the way that symptoms are showing up for people. Like how do we hold space for that for ourselves and for others? Um, and before we move on with the questions, I kind of want to ask you in this moment that we are in, um, what do you suggest people do that are struggling um, either with overwhelming anxiety or depression or, you know, struggling in any way right now mentally during what is a really, really difficult time? And just in case, sorry, just in case people listen to this later, what we're talking about obviously is we're in this kind of coronavirus spin spiral right now. So if you listen to this later, that's what we're talking about. Right. So is the question, say, kind of uh, rephrase the question again, just how do people, I guess I'll let you ask it again. Yeah. So, you know, if you are struggling, struggling in some way mentally during a time when I feel and have been saying to so many clients, everybody is understandably struggling right Mm -hmm. now mentally in some way. Um, What are some things you, you mentioned walking, you mentioned getting out. Are there any other things you think it's important for people to be doing to take care of their mental health at a point in mean, a time like this? Excuse me. Right. And and this is a very trying time. I mean, mm-hmm. everybody is losing money. Everybody's losing money on the retirement funds. Mm-hmm. It, this isn't just you. Mm-hmm. So we're all in this together. And again, this is a great opportunity to find a new passion. Uh, walking, doing art, knitting. Um, maybe you're into sports. Well, the sports aren't happening right now. So find another, find another passion. Mm. And, um, you know, exercise truly is a gift, but maybe you're in, you're very intellectual and you want to read books that you've never read before. This is a great opportunity to learn and embrace yourself and love yourself. Mm. Um, I think the best gift on how to get better is it's right there. It's loving yourself. Mm. So how do you do that? You take it one step at a time. Mm. First step, what am I going to do today that's going to make me smile? Or who am I going to pick up the phone and call today that is always there for me to make me smile? Mm. Little baby steps. I love that. That actually could be it. Like what the the advice to give somebody, like do one thing today that you know is going to make you smile. Yeah. That in itself, right? It's like you said it's a baby step, and yet that's so huge. Baby step could be wave to your neighbor that you've never acknowledged before. Mm, right. And you could start a whole new friendship six feet away. Let's keep it <laughs> away. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but I, I think that is something that I come back to so often with clients. You know, so many of our struggles as humans come back to, I believe, a lack of self compassion, right? Mm-hmm. If we are really hard on ourselves, it's really hard for us to be compassionate with others, right? It's really hard for us to have tolerance for us falling short if we don't have, excuse me, tolerance for other people falling short if we don't have that for ourselves. So I love that you just said, start with self-love. You know, if we can just start there, so many things can shift. Mm -hmm. Right. And self-love comes in so many beautiful forms. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it's such a great opportunity to do so much more for ourselves. It really is. That's the gift. I mean, there aren't many gifts that are coming out of this, but they are out there. They're hiding, but we can find them and bring them out. And this can really become something powerful to make our world even better. Right. And I think that goes for even those people who are listening who are homeschooling three children and trying to work from home and juggling how the hell am I going to make my rent? You know, it's not to minimize that there is some serious struggle happening out there. But if you do the baby step, like we just said, do one thing today that you know will make you smile, that doesn't take a lot of time. But to Danae's point, if you do it for yourself, it's going to radiate out towards others, right? If you show yourself that love and compassion, that is naturally going to emanate outwards. And that little baby step is something all of us can do no matter where we're at or how much we're struggling with. And sometimes people make this steps of, oh, I want to lose five pounds. I'm going to feel so much better. But really, Embrace who you are. Love your body. Is five pounds really going to change your world and make you suddenly happy? Mm. You know, it's it's not, this isn't about losing weight or gaining weight. This is about finding that that's very artificial in my opinion. It's Mm -hmm. short lived. It's like buying a new car. Okay. That's a short lived happiness. The the new car smell is going to go away. What was that? It's that dopamine bump, right? But it goes away. Yeah. Yeah. So this is more about 
finding, finding something, um, not so much how to change your appearance, because that, again, that self, that has a, a little short-lived vibe to it. Mm -hmm. But how can we find something to bring into our life, bring into our mind that changes us? Mm -hmm. I think that's, would you agree? You know, we can paint our nails and that's going to make us feel good. Again, it's short-lived. But what can we bring into our life that is going to last? Mm -hmm. well, more, couldn't agree more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So what breaks your heart, Susie? What breaks my heart is... Um, the, the cruelty, the meanness to other people, the judgment, the shame that we went over earlier. Mm -hmm. I think that that truly breaks my heart, how we can really hurt somebody. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, that's where I'm all about the compassion and the love. And first of all, you have to love yourself in order to project love and give love. And then you'll be loved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Love it. I feel like some of our questions you've already answered a little bit. Um, so I, what's, what's your favorite food? What's a food that you would eat every day if you could? I, I eat um, rice cakes with chocolate on them every day. <laughs> oh, that sounds so good right now. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like that's my health food. People will laugh, but it has chocolate. I'm like, whatever. We need chocolate every day. We need chocolate. Um, it's important. <laughs> but I'm, food into, um, I'm getting into sushi a lot. So that's my favorite food and pizza. Mm. Oh, and a filet, a really good filet. <laughs> so you like food is what you're saying. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I am an uh, expensive palate, I would say. <laughs> uh, Susie, this has been amazing. I'm so grateful that we were able to catch you and, and mm. you've been so gracious for those of you. Who, I don't think we actually said this earlier, but we, we chatted with Susie before and we had some technical issues um, and you were amazing enough to, to get back on with us. And I'm so glad that we did this because I love you guys, of oh, course, awesome. you know, but you guys yeah. tell me your favorite food real quick. Oh, wow. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> I love dessert so much. It's, it's like cinnamon rolls. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Why that's are you embarrassed? Amazing. That's a very specific food. I don't know why food. I find that so embarrassing, but I do. <laughs> Those are really good. <laughs> Well, you know, there cinnamon, is that vegan, right? that vegan cinnamon roll place in Silver Lake. Oh my gosh, I have a problem with desserts. <laughs> it's a problem. The thing is, if you're going to have a dessert, go all out. Agreed. I mean, yeah. yeah oh, she does. Oh, <laughs> oh I do. In oh, fact, Vanessa may or may not have almost lost a hand once with a spoon coming towards my plate. <laughs> it is true. She gets, she gets very aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> She's food aggressive, dessert aggressive. That's right. Just desserts. You know, they bring you a couple spoons at, at a restaurant. I'm like, I don't need another spoon. This is not for this anybody but my myself. Dessert. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Oh, man. Yeah. But, mine is but mine if, is macaroni and cheese. As somebody who I always say I'm like 90% vegan and I try mm. so hard to stay away from all dairy. If I could bathe in macaroni and cheese, I would do it happily with no shame. <laughs> wow, that's a good one. Yeah. Both of you guys, let's just have a food party. Oh and God, just... I'm so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so down. That is literally though, Susie, um, after all of this is over, you have to let Vanessa and I come take you to dinner as a thank you. And um, Please. we would just really love to see you. And I, I feel like we will never take a restaurant for granted again, but absolutely yes. we'd love to come or to human contact. take you to dinner. Yeah. That is a date. And then we're each having our own dessert. No sharing. <laughs> Thank you. She gets me. <laughs> Don't encourage her. Uh, I get you. <laughs> you get me. Uh, well, I Susie, get you. yeah, I just, I have to echo Vanessa. This has meant the world to us. And you are just truly one of the most gracious, kind human beings I've ever had the honor of knowing. Oh. I love you so much. Thank you for doing this. Um, anyone who does not follow Susie on Instagram, her handle is Favor Hamilton. So much wisdom and inspiration and just permission to be the fullest expression of you that you get through her posts. Thank you for that. Um, please keep sharing yourself with the rest of us because you are doing such an incredible service to the world, Susie. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, I guess I'll depart on this one thing, and that is own your flaws. Mm -hmm. Own who you are. And that's been a secret to me in getting healthy is I own it. I own yes. my story. I embrace it. It's made me who I am today. So everybody out there, own it. 
and just go for it. Don't be ashamed. Love it. <laughs> love it. Love it. I love, love you. you guys. <laughs> Thank you love so much, you. Susie. Thank you, Susie. Bye bye. <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this episode of Cheaper Than Therapy. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you want to connect with us, you can find us on Instagram at Vanessa S. Bennett and at Danae Logan Selkin.